السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم ایس اینڈ ویلکمس یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر نائنٹین آف مارکیٹنگ آف نان پرافٹس ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو ایٹ ایٹ دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی نو دیٹ کمیونیکیشن از این آؤٹ گروتھ آف اے ویری کامپرہینسو اسٹریٹجک پروسیس وچ ہیز تھری ڈفرینٹ اسٹیجز دا ون از دی آرگنائزیشنل اسٹیج اور لیول فار دیٹ میٹر دی ادر ون از دی آئیڈینٹی لیول and the third one is the experiential level. We've gone through the first two levels and, and have understood very comprehensively how significant the whole process is for different strategic considerations to put in place and then come up with uh, the final positioning for the organization. If we have the right positioning, we will have the right personality for the organization. And once we have clarity on both the aspects, the meaning, the positioning, and the personality that we can put together effective communication campaigns. Therefore, we can say this is something which is not short-term. It is a long-term process, and the uh, comprehensiveness of the process uh, ensures that uh, we have the right positioning and right personality, and hence accurate reflection of uh, those two features into our communication campaigns. There are um, a few important uh, measures that uh, we have to take before uh, we get on to developing understanding for the next level, which is experiential level. And uh, these uh, measures uh, are uh, to be uh, really uh, kept in mind uh, before uh, we um, know what exactly is the mix of tools that uh, we have uh, to have to ourselves in order to uh, make our campaign uh, very effective given our financial situation and given our human resource capabilities. So in other words, what I'm saying is uh, there are so many different tools. It is not important that we could put together all those tools and uh, could bring them to uh, application in order to make a campaign very effective. No, the answer lies in going for those tools which are compatible with our capabilities and uh, our competencies. Therefore, this uh, component of learning is uh, going to be about measures for effective messaging. The first one is that we need to take stock of for the competitive landscape. We as marketing people have to monitor the competitive landscape uh, on a continual basis. In other words, if we are into a long-term uh, process and uh, are out to develop a communication campaign Uh, truly reflective of the personality uh, of the cause, then we've got to understand and know what exactly is it that uh, our peers or our competitors, for that matter, are doing. Uh, because that uh, allows us to develop a sense of context. And in that context, we can compare ourselves with others. And we really can size ourselves up in terms of where we really stand. Uh, stand in terms of different uh, the campaigns, Uh, whether it is uh, the more important for us to go for uh, uh, prints or uh, it is more um, um, weighty uh, for uh, the organization to uh, follow the online course and so on and so forth. Uh, there are uh, so many different ways uh, by which um, we can uh, develop insights into what competition is doing. And the fact is this takes us back to uh, one of the Uh, components that uh, we already have learned, and that is the marketing information systems. You will recall that marketing intelligence systems as part of the overall marketing information systems is the concept that I'm referring to. Marketing people have got to be uh, not just intelligent in terms of um, applying their knowledge to uh, the, the, the concepts of marketing, but they have to be very smart in generating information on part of the competitors, uh, what they are doing, what is it that is working for them, what is it that is not working or that has not worked for them, and therefore the lesson that we can learn from it, uh, the kind of things that we should look into. How do we go about putting together different pieces of information into a proper perspective is another challenge that uh, we face as marketing people. Well, um, could we um, develop um, our insights could by picking uh, the bits and pieces from uh, publications, 
uh, from um, newsletters, from uh, online uh, the material that uh, the competitors have posted uh, in relation to their um, programs. And uh, we also collect information from stakeholders who happen to be common in the marketplace because there are uh, donors who are common to uh, the more than one cause. And uh, therefore, talking with such people um, bring to us a lot of insight into uh, those things uh, which will allow us to make uh, better decisions about our communication process and our communication campaigns. These uh, the bits and pieces of information collected from so many different sources, uh, may those be um, highly structured uh, the print materials or uh, the online uh, cyberspace uh, the information or uh, information collected from uh, activists, uh, the volunteers, um, the board of directors of uh, other organizations. All those pieces have to be put together um, into a proper form. How do we do that? That is another challenge that we face. Well, it is just like uh, the carrying out secondary research, uh, which uh, we put together uh, by looking into different sources and uh, the develop certain formats, giving them different captions and whatever um, we think uh, belongs to uh, the one particular caption, uh, we take it there. Uh, if you uh, take a look at the very traditional index cards, uh, way of uh, the carrying out research, because you will know what I mean, uh, but uh, it is not uh, really confined to index cards, because you can also use uh, your laptops and uh, have uh, the different formats defined in terms of, for example, donors, um, people who are involved into programs, uh, meaning people who work for the organization and people who are not part of the organization, but they really matter in terms of uh, the offering their help. Again, I would say like uh, the activists, uh, the volunteers, and community leaders uh, who keep working uh, for uh, the organization and are helpful toward execution of your programs, uh, you can have uh, your uh, format divided into different sub-formats, giving them different captions in terms of all those stakeholders uh, who matter to the organization. And whatever information you collect in relation to any one of those, you can take that piece to the relevant portion of the format. And once you have put together all of those so the bits and pieces, you can synthesize that information into a cohesive whole, which makes a lot of sense. And I would again draw your attention towards secondary research that you carry out with the help of so many different books, periodicals, newspapers, uh, the other publications obtained from uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, put those pieces together and uh, to give those a, a, a shape and form uh, which makes sense as uh, a consolidated uh, piece of uh, research. It is a secondary research, and that is precisely the reason that marketing intelligence systems form uh, the part of uh, the marketing information systems, uh, which uh, has in its fold the marketing research as well. So in other words, this, uh, you can say, happens to be a counterpart to the marketing research process. Very important from that point of view, that we take stock of uh, the uh, competitors' uh, moves and their formulations in terms of their strategies and their execution tactics in order to make sure that whatever we have put together in terms of our communication campaigns as part of the communication strategy is still relevant to our organization. And if it is relevant, then we are on course. If we realize that we are losing relevance somewhere along the line, we have to look into that. And of course, that will take us back to the organizational level or the identity level of the organization. I would say the more so to the organizational level and less so to the identity level because identity level is an outgrowth of the organizational level. And therefore, we've got to take a very precise look at you know, all the things starting from the vision right down to the positioning and the personality of the organization and hence the cause. So 
monitoring the competitive landscape is a very important measure that we should not lose sight of uh, while we are uh, putting together different tools of communication um, to uh, give the final uh, the shape and form to our communication strategy. The second one is about the fact that uh, the many NPOs uh, do not really give due importance to the fact that uh, the all communications could have to be carried out uh, the, from the standpoint of our audiences. Until the time they start talking in terms of for the audiences, um, they will not uh, they take the desired action. In other words, it is the responsibility of the marketing people from the nonprofit side that they talk in such terms that the audiences develop a sense of self. Because what is the sense of self? This basically is a sense of developing a personal relationship with the cause and with the organization. If organizations think that uh, by talking about their strengths, uh, their resources, and their expertise, and so on and so forth, they can convince the audiences into taking the desired action, they are mistaken. Because uh, until the time audiences are in a position to relate themselves um, with the cause, by developing the motivational uh, side of their inner self, they will not take the desired action. This is the essence of uh, this uh, the particular point. Now, what is it that uh, we talk with the audiences? Well, we basically talk about the benefit exchange, and uh, that is something that has to be brought home, that by taking the desired action, the audiences stand to gain. And what the gain? We talk about that as part of the messaging platform. You know, we talk with different audiences. We talk with donors. We talk with um, all those who are responsible for the programs. And we talk with all those who are uh, advocating on our behalf. Therefore, we've got to make sure that whatever we have as part of the messaging platform addresses uh, concerns and interests and motivations of all the audiences. Here the question is, how can we talk in so many different terms? Well, the answer lies in having a messaging platform where we talk about so many different features of the program. We also talk about testimonials and uh, inspiring and motivational stories uh, which uh, they can relate with uh, real life situations. And uh, therefore, we've got to have a comprehensive um, messaging platform which carries uh, appeals uh, for all the audiences. However, we can say here, uh, when we are executing programs, we need to have the different communications for different audiences, and there we've got to be very precise in terms of the messages that we carry as part of the communications. And again, you see, we go back to the, the level of motivations, what is it that motivates a person to donate, and what is it that inspires, that inspires a person to uh, start working with a lot of passion for uh, your program uh, without any uh, motives, uh, just on altruistic basis. So these are the kind of motivations that we have to unearth and relate those with um, the cause and uh, to talk about the uh, benefit that uh, different audiences uh, will derive by making their respective contributions toward the program. Whether they make those contributions by giving money, or they could make contribution could by working for the organization, or they make contribution could by doing some lobbying for you among the um, legislators or among the, the media, could because could these two uh, the constituencies could have become extremely important for nonprofits all over the world. Uh, whatever your cause is, could if you have support could from the media and also could from the legislature, could you are could going to have uh, a lot of uh, advantages in terms of execution of your uh, the program. Uh, going back to uh, the, what kind of communication uh, you should put together so that uh, the, you can be very convincing um, for uh, the, all the audiences, uh, the, you have to keep uh, the, a couple of other factors in mind, and those are the factors of the right mood of communication, and the right moment when the communication is um, sent, and the right the messenger uh, who carries the communication. Mood of communication in terms of your programs is just like packaging 
on the commercial side. But what packaging does for a particular product, communication on the nonprofit side is something that has to do uh, the complete job. The reason I say complete job, because on the commercial side, you have uh, the package for the product, which uh, does a lot of communication by itself, and then you have the punchline or the tagline, and uh, whatever you are communicating as part of the total communication campaign uh, that carries your message all across the uh, communication spectrum. But here you see on the nonprofit side, you are constrained to only deal with your communication message, because of the fact that we do not really have something very tangible with which we can play. I will give you the example of a toothpaste. For example, a manufacturer trying to highlight the menthol factor uh, of um, the toothpaste would like to introduce a package which is predominantly green because you know, he is conveying the message that this is cool. Uh, by the same token, the manufacturer of a toothpaste that fights cavities would like to give a package which is predominantly red. Now, this is not the case with the nonprofits, and therefore we have to create uh, the mood uh, by way of having a communication uh, which is very effective and uh, which reaches the audience not just physically where they are, but a communication which reaches our audiences where their mental and their emotional locations are. This is extremely important. And in order to reach their mental and emotional states, you have to be very smart with developing a sense of self on your audience's side so that they can relate themselves with the cause. So in other words, when you are talking about the nursing home, you've got to give your communication the mood of hope and happiness and satisfaction and no worries because you are communicating to uh, these, the, the, the relatives of those elderly people that these elderly people are going to be very well looked after and therefore the latest the years of their life are going to be full of happiness and hope uh, and not hardship. So therefore the mood of the communication has got to coincide with the mood of those who make the decisions. In this particular case, the decision makers or the influencers are the family members, the young couples who just cannot afford to have their elders in their homes because um, they all work and there is nobody at home to take care of their elders. And therefore, um, when it comes to developing the mood of communication, it has to be in total sync with the mood of those who make decisions for that particular cause or for that particular decision which is going to bring improvement into their lives, which brings about social welfare and which fulfills a certain social responsibility. Similarly, we have to have the right messenger to put our message across. Now, this may sound very trivial, but the fact is this carries a lot of seriousness because there is a general tendency on part of all of us that we like to hear what other people are doing. And especially, we like to hear what those people who are people of authority, people who are liked, people who are respected, people who are our heroes, people who are our peers, and people who are our family members what they say and what they do is something which really carries a lot of appeal for us. And therefore, if we as the marketing managers at nonprofits are putting together a campaign, we've got to be very watchful of who the messenger is going to be for the message. So in other words, people give a lot of importance to the message which somebody else is delivering because message delivered by somebody else carries an extra punch. This is uh, the basic psychology of all of us. And this takes us back to the concept of uh, the social power. Here lies the proof of the social power. What others uh, say and do, we like to follow them. And like I said earlier, especially if it is said by somebody who really matters to us, and I would like to draw your attention to one of the more successful and impressive campaigns in which our cricketing hero, Vaseem Akram, talks about the fight against diabetes. 
There can be other examples as well, but the fact here is that most of the nonprofits all over the world bring people from different walks of life of which film stars, celebrities, sports people, authorities in their respective fields like doctors, professors, and like I said earlier, even peers happen to be the part of the campaign as messengers. Peers uh, seem to carry a lot of influence over uh, the, uh, the target market. And uh, here I would like to give you an example from um, the academia. Many universities like to show those students who have graduated from their universities and are settled into the practical world uh, enjoying good positions. And they give testimonials as uh, part of uh, the advertising programs. So this is an example of peers. Now, you, you really get impressed by somebody telling you his or her story in terms of their success. And in relation to an organization or a program which really has mattered to them. And in the process, they convince you of the utility and of the strength of that particular program. So these are the examples of uh, um, having good messengers uh, to carry and deliver your message. Because if you deliver the same message by yourself, it may not be as effective as it is if delivered by people I have given examples of. In certain situations, uh, the family members could happen to be the very good uh, influencers as uh, the messengers. Wives can be good, effective messengers as part of advertising campaigns because they really can convince husbands in terms of uh, their being regular uh, to check um, blood pressure and test their uh, uh, blood sugar levels. Uh, Nonprofits do uh, cast uh, uh, role models as uh, messengers uh, when it comes to convincing uh, that population which consists of husbands. And therefore, I have given you this example from the real life. The third aspect of having a good communication go across is uh, the moment, meaning in addition to mood and the messenger. We have got to find the right moment when to shoot our uh, communication to the target audience. Not uh, all the time um, the communications uh, really home in uh, to the uh, hearts and minds of our audiences. And therefore, uh, just like uh, uh, the uh, concept of aperture in a camera which captures a particular scene at a particular moment, you've got to capture that particular moment uh, during which um, your audiences are open-minded and they are thinking of taking the action. This also that takes us back to the various stages of uh, uh, consumer behavior and in particular the stage where uh, your audience is just about uh, ready to take the desired action that you uh, hammer in at that time with your message. And therefore you've got to be quick and smart at uh, the picking the right moment. I think uh, the one example which I gave you earlier in this particular regard but in a different context is uh, about uh, collecting uh, donations just before the advent of the month of Ramadan. The people already have started thinking about giving donations to different causes. And yours could be one of the prime candidates. And therefore, if you capture that particular moment and kick off a convincing communication campaign which has all the features of a good strategic formulation, the chances are that you will end up raising the requisite amount of funds that you have budgeted for yourselves. So these are the kind of subtle uh, features uh, which uh, the good communication campaign uh, the must uh, the have to themselves uh, when you are putting together your campaigns. But the main point here is what is it that you communicate? What exactly is it that you talk about? And once again I will say uh, it is the benefit exchange. And therefore uh, you've got to be very sensitive to two different factors. Uh, the one is the 
motivational factors could be behind actions could be which different audiences take, meaning donors, activists, people from media, people from the government and community leaders, so on and so forth. All these people have their own motivations because they derive different benefits out of working or out of contributing toward the cause. And therefore, developing those relational lines and relating those to the cause is the name of the game. Motivational factors can be established with the help of marketing research. And this takes us back to the exercise of uh, segmentation in which I gave you the example of uh, what motivates different people to donate. I think there are uh, the four or five different adjectives which basically can uh, the generalize the different levels of motivation, uh, the whether we talk of uh, donors or uh, the other stakeholders. And uh, those uh, could be generalized as um, conviction, uh, the sympathy, religious benefits, altruism, and uh, even publicity. People like to uh, do things uh, which uh, look very noble and which are noble, uh, but you know they have their own uh, the person publicity uh, as an ulterior motive. So be it. If they think that way, let them think that way. You have to capitalize on the way they think so that you can communicate with them in that particular mode so that you can stir their feelings in the subconscious uh, to take the desired action. So here, the key is not just reaching your audience, or rather um, getting into their uh, inner conscience to stir their feelings into making the final decision. Two things that I've talked about uh, and also having said that they happen to be very important, number one is uh, developing the uh, relational lines okay, the, and the other one is talking about the benefit exchange are uh, things okay, which generally okay, the NPOs forget to talk about. They uh, put their uh, uh, competencies and uh, their strengths um, in front of okay, these two uh, factors and uh, talk in their own terms. And that is something which generally um, does not work. In order for communications to be very effective, uh, they've got to take stock of these two features, i.e. the motivational factors and the benefit exchange. So we can say that uh, after we have uh, developed the motivational factors and uh, the uh, relational uh, lines uh, and uh, uh, developed uh, a proper uh, perspective on uh, the part of the audiences about uh, who we are and what exactly is it that we do, we are all set to put together our communication campaigns. Uh, and uh, we are in a position to choose the right channel that uh, we need in order to reach our audience. And I would again say, reach them not where they are physically, but reach them in terms of their mental and emotional locations. The third uh, the measure that uh, the nonprofit managers gonna have to keep in their mind is that uh, the most of the nonprofit organizations are uh, cash starved and they do not really have the kind of financial resource they may like to have in order to be able to have the kind of forget the visibility and outreach with which uh, everybody desires. Because who doesn't really want to have a great outreach and a very high level of vis visibility uh, when one is working on marketing programs? And may those programs could be from the commercial side or may those be from the non-profit side. The challenge on the non-profit is uh, the much greater uh, because of the financial constraints. Here, I would like to draw a distinction between large organizations and medium to small organizations. Uh, when I talk about large organizations, I am essentially referring to those organizations which happen to have adequate financial resources. And these are the organizations which can put together their communication programs in all the possible manifestations of communication tools. In other words, they can have uh, access to all kinds of uh, uh, print media, all uh, uh, the kinds of uh, the online um, 
uh, the facilities and uh, that they can uh, uh, be very effective in person uh, when it comes to uh, conducting seminars or uh, other uh, um, galas uh, where uh, they uh, need to spend uh, uh, a, a huge amount of money in order to be close to their audiences. But these are the kind of factors which uh, are rather situations which uh, are uh, not the uh, luxuries uh, enjoyed by those non-profit organizations that happen to be within the bracket of small to medium-sized organizations. So the question here is, what is it that uh, you know, these uh, the smaller ones or those who do not really have adequate financial resources do when it comes to uh, putting together communication campaigns. Let me be quick here in uh, adding one more fact uh, that goes to the favor of large organizations and to the disfavor of uh, smaller ones. And that is the presence of uh, the larger organizations online. They can afford to have uh, their presence online by having beautiful, impressive uh, websites uh, which are interactive and uh, they also can afford to bring about technology the updates every couple of years whenever um, those are warranted. Uh, but small to medium-sized organizations that do not really have that kind of financial resource uh, are constrained to do all that. As a matter of fact, the one research tells us that many nonprofits, uh, even within the United States, are uh, having difficulty in trying to understand uh, what really things like YouTube and Flickr uh, mean to them because uh, they are not in a position to uh, keep up with uh, the developments that are taking place uh, you know, from time to time. So this is uh, the one example uh, of uh, the kind of constraints that uh, the smaller organizations or those that are uh, uh, not uh, really um, financial resource rich um, uh, facing uh, in terms of uh, having uh, the very effective uh, communication uh, the tools at their disposal. So the question here arises, what exactly is it that uh, these organizations that are constrained uh, can do? Well, what they can do is be a little organized and be a little proactive in their management and marketing style. Now, this may sound to the very uh, traditional, but the fact is that here lies the answer to the question that I raised, because uh, these organizations could have got to uh, could be uh, very professional in terms of uh, could putting together their uh, the budgetary requirements for the coming year. And when I talk about the budgetary requirements, they have to take into consideration complete marketing programs, including communication campaigns that they envisage taking place during the year. Um, and when we talk about budget, of course, we're talking about costs, the meaning all those costs that are associated with different activities, the marketing activities, communication activities that will take place. And this also includes the good staff members, because here we have the one constraint which keeps the many organizations from being effective, and that is the shortage of good staff. So these organizations, having taken into consideration all the budgetary requirements for the coming year can be very convincing um, in presenting those budgets to the sponsors of the organization and all those stakeholders who matter for making the program successful. So in other words, you can put those budgets before the board of directors and you can also have you know, major donors attend those meetings and you can have all those stakeholders be a part of that process okay, who can be helpful toward okay, making your programs successful. Now, those okay, the people may not okay, they give you um, hard cash to begin with, but they really can okay, be very supportive in uh, kind. Uh, you have uh, directors and uh, sponsors and other stakeholders who happen to be from the commercial world, and they are okay, the part of a uh, huge, uh, the important uh, the meaningful commercial enterprises because that generally is the case with most of the nonprofits. They go for uh, the board of directors uh, comprising of people who are influential basically uh, on the uh, commercial side. Um, 
those people can offer uh, support to, to your uh, marketing and communication departments uh, from uh, their uh, resource um, bank because they have um, a sizable resource in terms of their marketing department or their communication department and they can always lend you support and uh, make your job a uh, little less difficult or a lot less difficult and uh, uh, lay the ground for making a program successful. Uh, here, you need to have uh, the good staff, no question about it, because we are basically talking about a long-term approach. The measures that we need to take are uh, going to be mindful of in order to have effective messaging all relate to the long-term strategic process. And whenever we talk about the long-term strategic process, a good staff members uh, are a key to that. Because uh, without uh, the good staff members, situation is always extremely stressful in uh, the putting good strategies together. And also uh, executing uh, good strategies uh, the way um, any uh, the good team of uh, uh, strong professionals uh, would like uh, the whole thing to unfold. And uh, therefore, uh, you also have to uh, put into the, the budgetary requirements uh, your staff requirements. Now, those um, staff members uh, which uh, uh, may still uh, not be um, a part of uh, your uh, organization, uh, even after uh, you have presented the budget, you at least can uh, get support uh, from uh, your uh, sponsors the way I just explained. They can um, lend professional support to you from their uh, the staff members uh, who happen to be very meaningful to their respective organizations. Another strategy uh, which you can uh, make uh, good use of is cost marketing. I mean, let's go back and talk about the concept of cost marketing. You get into cost marketing because uh, you want to strengthen and leverage uh, your position as a nonprofit organization and the commercial enterprise uh, wants to prove itself that uh, it is a socially responsible organization and in the process it leverages its own brand. It is a win-win situation for both the parties. So uh, you can get into that kind of a situation and even then uh, you have to uh, put all that as uh, the part of a convincing budgetary process or a budgetary exercise which has to be presented to the board of directors and, um, and then um, seek uh, their support in tangible terms. Um, the fact is that uh, your cost partners can offer you a lot of support in uh, making your marketing program uh, very effective um, in addition to the features of uh, authenticity and legitimacy. You will recall all these um, features that I talked about uh, as that particular component. So here, the, uh, the summary of uh, uh, this particular uh, the measure is that uh, we need to keep uh, everything in a very well-planned perspective. And we have to be proactive in realizing and in envisaging what exactly is it that is coming our, our way and what are the uh, strategic measures that we need to undertake to make our program uh, effective within our financial constraints and uh, to put all that as part of your budgetary exercise. And another uh, important uh, factor to summarize here is that whatever uh, you do uh, has got to be in line uh, with your uh, marketing programs, uh, which are a reflection of the organizational level and of course also the identity level of the organization. Uh, and another thing that uh, we should be mindful of here as well is our ability to uh, monitor the competitive landscape all the time because uh, we are in a position to collect uh, some very uh, significant uh, small bits and pieces of information which when put together form such a whole, such a cohesive whole uh, which uh, becomes as significant as a finding of uh, the marketing research program at times, if not always. Here, I would like to add a couple of more points in terms of uh, the summarizing uh, the, this particular measure. We've got to develop a complete system of monitoring the budget that we have uh, put together. In other words, we need to have a complete uh, reporting system uh, which highlights what has been achieved 
as against the what was budgeted and the, what are the variations in terms of the spend uh, the, from time to time. You need to have you know, daily reports, weekly reports, monthly reports, and then of course, yearly summaries. Now, these are uh, the kind of things the which again the take us uh, back to the, the marketing information systems. And here I would like to point out uh, another thing that uh, all these things are interrelated. And this is the beauty of building uh, knowledge blocks uh, by uh, relating the one particular concept with another so that uh, we um, can develop an understanding of how things work in the practical world uh, when we have uh, all the concepts in our mind the but are uh, the working with all of them uh, at the same time. So uh, which are the ones uh, which we can draw on immediately and uh, therefore drawing relationships between uh, different ones at this particular moment could well uh, develop that particular understanding. Uh, marketing information systems. And uh, you will recall that uh, the very first component of that system is the internal reports. We have to have reports on which uh, the management, uh, the starting from the top management right down to the lowest level of management, could have to count on because those reports tell us what is happening within the organization day in and day out. So what I'm saying is whatever is happening or whatever has happened over a certain period uh, of the past, uh, we have to take stock of that in light of what we had budgeted earlier. All the spending that uh, we had envisaged uh, would be uh, allocated or was allocated to different activities. Uh, are we making the use of those funds and are those uh, activities being executed in the right uh, way and in the right manner? Are we on track? Are we off track? If we are, what are the reasons? So it is not just a question of uh, the putting uh, together uh, the certain uh, financial requirements as uh, part of the budget and uh, presenting those uh, before the board of directors for their approval. It also is a question of uh, having a very uh, well-structured professional uh, marketing management that can uh, move uh, and execute its programs according to a pre-planned uh, the formulation in which uh, the we can uh, the look at the variances, uh, the what is it see, that has been achieved uh, the within the budget and what is it uh, which is causing overruns and what are the causes of those overruns. Uh, the, were we not really mindful of um, the extraneous factors uh, the which uh, can have caused those overruns or we were not even aware of the internal requirements uh, which uh, all of a sudden have come our way and have caused uh, those overruns. So there could be so many different uh, uh, developments uh, and happenings uh, which will uh, uh, make you uh, scratch your uh, brains and uh, look into the overall situation from so many different angles and dimensions to dissect the overall situation and then pinpoint uh, where have you gone wrong and where uh, did you go, where you went right. And this is uh, something which can be connected with uh, the monitoring the landscape. When you monitor the competitive landscape and try to establish what they are uh, doing and what is working for them and what is not working for them and make a comparison with what you are doing and what is working for you and what is not working for you, you end up establishing what exactly are your strengths and what your weaknesses are. And whatever your strengths are, you try to reinforce those and whatever your weaknesses are, you try to rectify those. And here you see, you bring about a change in your strategic thinking and this is linked with the organizational level where you started the whole thing and you have to go back to those stages where something that might have taken place that has caused the certain weaknesses. If the objective is to ward off threats as part of the SWOT analysis, then you've got to overcome the weaknesses so that you can uh, the cash in all the opportunities which the marketplace 
uh, kind of offers, and uh, you can uh, kind of cash in um, those opportunities only kind of if you can uh, easily capitalize on your strengths kind of with no um, significant and meaningful weaknesses. So uh, all these things are uh, kind of intertwined, and uh, kind of the one particular uh, summary of uh, the, the budgetary exercise kind of has taken us into so many different dimensions of not just um, this particular measure uh, to keep our communication uh, or other communications kind of very effective, but also into other uh, uh, interconnected areas of uh, uh, the nonprofit uh, kind of marketing mix that uh, kind of we have learned so far. Let me now give you the overall summary of the component that uh, we have covered over the lecture. It is a long-drawn, comprehensive, strategic process, the outgrowth of which is our communication plan, our communication campaign. It is not something which is whimsical. It is not something which rests on the concept of putting together certain communication tools and, and then just kicking off those tools as uh, the communication um, vehicles. Uh, we go to the print media, we go online, and we start uh, conducting different promotional programs and so on and so forth. It is not that. It uh, is a strategic process which starts basically with the organizational level analysis of the brand raising process and then takes us into the identity level. And if we have taken a good stock of the organizational level, which starts with the mission, uh, rather vision of the organization, and then takes us into the mission and values and objectives, and then right down to positioning and personality, then the chances are that our identity level has been um, carved out very carefully, depending on the positioning and the personality of the organization. And the identity level is the true reflection of those two particular features. This is what we have learned. And once we have done that, we are all set to get on with the third level of the brand raising process, which is the experiential level. I've not yet talked about the level per se, because I think there is a tremendous need on our part to understand uh, the various measures that we need to consider the, before we start putting together all those tools that form the experiential level. Uh, like I said earlier, it is not just a question of uh, putting those tools together and then forming a communication campaign. It is the question of understanding what we have done as the part of the organizational level and identity level. Are we on track uh, after having uh, been done with these two levels? Well, the chances are, uh, yes, we are. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we have to be very sensitive and very careful um, in terms of making sure that uh, we have not uh, made any mistakes uh, in terms of um, considering those factors uh, which are extremely important uh, while we communicate with our audiences. And I would like to repeat here as well that uh, the audiences are different. For different audiences, we have different kinds of communications and we've got to um, communicate with them uh, in different moods, we have to pick up different moments. We have to be very um, clever and smart about the messengers who deliver our message. And uh, we have to um, be uh, very circumspect and pragmatic uh, in terms of um, uh, putting together our budgetary requirements and how we put those before the board of directors and all those people who matter in terms of offering their support to the organization because their support matters a lot toward our success. So these are the kind of things that we needed to understand. And with this understanding, I would now like to talk about the experiential level as the next component. Thank you.